Please join us in scripture reading this morning from the books of Psalms, Psalms 5. In Psalms 5, we read that David prays that God will defend and guide him. Psalms chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and then 7 and 8. Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my laminate. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray. But I, by your great love, can come into your house. In reverence, I bow down towards your holy temple. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness. Because of my enemies, make your way straight before me. Primera Epístola Universal de San Juan Apóstol, capítulo 1, versos 5 al 9. Es for the young one five tonight. Eh, leo en español. Este es el mensaje que hemos oído de él. Y os anunciamos. Dios es luz y no hay ninguna tinieblas en él. Si decimos que tenemos comunión con él y andamos en tinieblas, mentimos y no practicamos la verdad. Pero si andamos en luz, como Él está en luz, tenemos comunión unos con otros, y la sangre de Jesucristo, su Hijo, nos limpia de todo pecado. Si decimos que no tenemos pecado, nos engañamos a nosotros mismos y la verdad no está en nosotros. Si confesamos nuestros pecados, él es fiel y justo para perdonar nuestros pecados y limpiarnos de toda maldad. This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light. In him there is not darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and Do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is fight for and just and will forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Please turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 4. In chapter 4, This is Jesus teaches and is rejected in his hometown. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. On rolling it, he found the place where it is written. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. So set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the sanctuary were fastened upon him. He began by saying, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do here in your hometown that we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. That Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to the widow in Zephrath 
in the region of Sidon. May the Lord bring blessing upon the reading of his word. Good morning to the saints in Santa Clarita. What a privilege it is to worship with you this morning. As I've uh, contemplated um, the message of the Lord for you um, today, been praying about it since since I was asked on Wednesday. You know what what would God have me to share with you? And um, today, I want to focus on forgiveness in all of our lives. How many of you need forgiveness? How many of you need forgiveness every day? You know, sometimes we sin willfully, and sometimes we sin out of ignorance or, um, you know, with, with, without even realizing it, but we all need grace. I, I loved your illustration um, today when you asked, you know, you said, I, I have a confession to make. I left a name out, and it was your wife's name. <laughs> and you said, I'm going to have a better week this next week. <laughs> You know, I mean, that's what grace is about. It's about, you know, letting go, confessing, you know, having that freedom and that joy that Jesus longs to give. And I, I, I thought of my opening illustration, um, to share with you this morning. And there's so many times I've needed grace in my life. And I thought, you know, I can share a personal testimony and it's kind of embarrassing to admit you know, how often I've needed grace in my life. But I can think of one instance. My husband and I were pastors of this church, and we'd heard this rumor that some of our church members thought that we didn't like them. And these were people that I had gone to academy with. I had known them for a really, really long time. And I I didn't have hard feelings about them at all. And so my husband said, you know, Jan, what can we do about it? You know, how can we, how can we fix this with them so that they realize that we are really not their enemies, you know, that we really do care for them and we really do love them. He said, you know, I have this idea. He says, why don't we invite them over for dinner some evening and we can just spend some time with them? I said, sure, that sounds like a great idea. Let's invite them for dinner. So I called them up, and I made arrangements for them to come that Wednesday to our house for dinner. Now, I could give you some excuses, but they they probably wouldn't be very good. My husband said, Jan, did you forget we have company coming over? On Tuesday evening, and they're staying with us all of Wednesday, and they're going to be with us Wednesday evening, and they're not leaving till Thursday. Did you forget? And I go, oh, yeah, I forgot. I'll have to call them up and and reschedule. Well, Monday went by, and Tuesday, Tuesday came, And we had the new principal and his wife and two kids staying with us. And we had our guests coming and staying with us with their two kids. And we left Wednesday morning to go on um, a a ferry trip to the San Juan Islands. We took a picnic lunch, and we had this wonderful time with our friends. So they're pastoral couple. And we enjoyed the day, and, and it, we, we finally got back in the evening, and the sun is just beginning to sink in the west, and we're heading east towards home. And then we came to... 
a place in the road which was only a mile and a half from these people's house. And I all of a sudden realized that I had not rescheduled dinner. And I said, oh, no. And Phil goes, what did you do this time? (laughs) And I said, I forgot to reschedule the time for these people to come over for lunch. And he goes, oh, Jan. You just really, really blew it. I go, oh, I know. And this was the days before cell phones. So I couldn't just pick up my cell phone and, you know, call him up and say, hey, I'm really sorry. You know, we didn't have cell phones in those days. So we got home. And, you know, my husband said, Jan, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to go eat some crow. So I called him up and apologized profusely for what I did. But it wasn't good enough. And I got off the phone, he goes, well, how did that go? And I said, not so well. I said, they're really angry. You know, they they thought we didn't like him, and then we invite them over for dinner and don't show up. I mean, how, how does that make you feel? And so I said, this is really a a very, very expensive error. He says, so what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go to the floor shop and I'm going to order flowers tomorrow. And I'm not going to have the florist deliver it. I'm going to personally deliver it. I said, not only that, I'm going to go to the Cinnabon factory and I'm going to get Cinnabons for the whole family. And I'm going to take it, I'm going to, you know, personally deliver it with the flowers. I don't remember the circumstances, but for whatever reason, my husband dropped me off at their house, and he went and ran an error, I mean errand. And um, I, I apologized with the flowers and the Cinnabon, and it still wasn't good enough. And I just ended up sobbing and sobbing, because I hadn't intentionally hurt them. But nevertheless, they were hurt. We need grace. We need the joy of forgiveness. We need the blessing of God. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Psalm 32. It's the second of the seven Psalms of Penitence. The historical context of Psalm 32 is found in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. I'll review the story with you just a little bit. The story is told of King David, who sent his army out in the spring. This year he didn't accompany them. This time he stayed home. And one evening, as he's gazing out the window, he sees a beautiful woman bathing, and he sends for her. A few weeks later, she sends a note, I'm pregnant. So David connives and plans to cover up his indiscretion, but it backfires on him. Bathsheba's husband Uriah has integrity and loyalty and doesn't submit to David's plans. And finally, David sends orders through Uriah himself to the captain of his army, Joab, to have Uriah killed by search, by sending him to the place of the most intense fighting. Then, after Uriah is dead, David takes Bathsheba as his wife, attempting to cover up his sins. God's not happy about that. He's just pleased. And so along comes Nathan the prophet. And Nathan tells a little tale about a rich man who takes a poor man's only lamb, one that is like family to him. David's hot and angry. He ought to be killed. And Nathan points the finger, you're the man. You're the rich man. 
The dagger meets David's heart. All of a sudden, he sees his true condition. He sees his selfishness. He sees his sinful, lustful, insatiable heart. And he repents. But there's one important, crucial sentence in that story that stands out. It's the one in 2 Samuel 12, 13. It says, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. David gave his own sentence. He should die. And God says, your sins put away. You will not die. Wow, David messed up so much. He added one sin to another in this downward spiral. Yet when he repents, God says, I've put away your sin. Is that good news? And so David, in his exuberance, in his joy, he writes Psalm 32, a contemplation. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whom spirit there is no deceit. Now, was there deceit in David before? Absolutely. But you notice he uses three words to describe sin. He uses sin, transgression, and iniquity. Transgression from the Hebrew, is the word pesha, meaning rebellion, departing from God. In other words, willful sin. Sin, in the Hebrew, is shata'a, meaning the missing the mark, failing to do one's duty. It's the sin of omission. Iniquity comes from the word awan, meaning moral distortion, crookedness, guilt. So we could reread this. Blessed or happy is he or she whose rebellion or willful sin is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Not in the sense that God is, overlooks the sin. No. It's that the sin is covered by the blood of Jesus. And there's forgiveness. Happy is the man or woman to whom the Lord does not impute. That is, to ascribe wickedness or crime, iniquity. And in whose spirit there's no deceit. Do you hear the good news? I was guilty. I was rebellious. I willfully sinned. I looked in the mirror. I was convicted that my sin was horrible. And I repented and I confessed. God didn't write the big letter A for adultery across my chest or write the the black letter M for murder across my hand. I came clean. I honestly confessed it all. And God didn't count me as wicked, but as clean and forgiven. It didn't take away the consequences. But God cleansed me. You can almost hear David continuing. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. 
oh, things got so dry inside me when, when I just kept trying to cover up that sin. Eugene Peterson in the Message Bible describes these verses this way. When I kept it all inside, my bones turned to powder. My words became day-long groans. The pressure never let up. All the juices of my life dried up. Deliberate, intentional sin has a way of doing that in our lives. Especially when we don't want anyone to know what's really true about us or, or when we don't want to get caught. You know, sometimes we go around acting pretty innocent. We can put on a really good show, but we know the truth about us. You think of the person recently who, who robbed the bank and his image was on television. The family members turned him in. He was the former police. Mm. It's painful to tell the truth, but you know, it's also painful to hide in shame and guilt. But God's Holy Spirit continued hammering into his conscience. And David said that his vitality and energy turned into the drought of summer. The stifling heat, the lack of water, his energy shriveled up. Was it that low point, that point of conviction, that point of despair, that he, like the prodigal son, said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. I will confess my rebellion and my willful sin. You can almost hear the relief in David's voice. And you, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Do you know what it's like to be forgiven? Do you know what it's like to be treated better than you deserve? Peter knew it. He denied Jesus three times, yet Jesus forgave him and used him as a powerful preacher of the gospel. Paul knew it. Formerly called Saul, he had persecuted Christ's followers, throwing some in prison and causing others to die. And he could say, I'm the chief of sinners. Yet God called him to evangelize the Gentiles. At this point in the Psalms, David gets excited. Forgiveness is so freeing. It's so powerful. It's so incredible. He's so overwhelmed by the incredible, merciful God that he exclaims, For this cause... Everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Last week we went to the Science Center to see the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit. After we peruse that exhibit, we walk through some of the other areas there. And one area is the desert area. And it showed a canyon. And it talked about the hazards of flash floods. I don't know if you've been there to see it. But as we were standing there reading, the th sound of thunder was heard in the distance. And after a short time, the water began to trickle down the canyon walls. Then all of a sudden, after several minutes, there was this sudden torrent of water cascading the canyon walls. And one little girl was standing off to the left. And she got soaked with water as it splashed over the plexiglass. It's as if David is saying, when you mess up, your grace, God, is so wonderful that anyone who is godly, anyone in their right mind, is going to turn to you. You're going to be my protector when the great waters flood in, and, and I'm just in and water deeper than I had imagined. 
I find my safety in you. I find deliverance. I find grace. Lord, even as badly as I messed up, you surround me with songs of deliverance. The next verse says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you shall go. I will guide you with my eye. Now, some commentators suggest that David is speaking. And that's the result of being forgiven is that he's willing to instruct others. Other commentaries suggest that it is God speaking. In the context of the psalm, I I can hear God speaking You messed up. You repented and confessed your sins. I forgave you and gave you mercy and covered your sin with the blood of Jesus. Guess what? I don't want you to continue along a sinful, disappointing path. I delivered you now. I will instruct you. I will teach you. I will watch over you if you are willing if you are willing, if you are willing. And God continues, don't be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle as they, else they will not come near you. Don't be stubborn. Don't run away from me. Don't put up objections. Let me guide you. And David concludes, many sorrows shall be to the wicked. But he who trusts in the Lord's mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. And shout for joy, all you upright in heart. You can picture the repentant, forgiven king. Those who do wicked and do wrong, they will be filled with many sorrows. They will not have peace of mind. It's hard to live and cover up sin with more sin. One gets deeper and deeper trying to cover up one sin and then another. On the other hand, Those who trust the Lord, even when they mess up badly, experience mercy, grace, undeserved favor, and it shall surround him. It will be like a blanket around him. And he concludes with this joy, this exuberant joy. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Be glad. Rejoice. Shout. Sing. Freedom. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas blind, but now I see. I don't know how many of you have heard this story about Albert Horsley. Maybe you know him better by the name of Harry Orchard. Back on December 30, 1905, Harry Orchard planted a bomb connected to the gate of the governor of Idaho, and he was killed. He confessed to killing 17 people, plus numerous other crimes. The the governor's wife was a Seventh-day Adventist. And sometime after Harry was convicted, she and family members gave him some literature about God's grace and forgiveness. Harry turned to God 
he turned to religion. Some people thought, you know, it was insincerity. But you know what? If, if we are to believe the Bible and believe the power of the gospel, the power of Jesus, we will believe. Just like he forgave David, he forgave Harry Orchard or Al- Albert Horsley. Our Bible reading today, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, not some unrighteousness, not part of our sins, but all. And like the prophet Nathan told King David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Like the paralytic brought to Jesus through the roof, in the presence of Jesus, we find freedom from sin. Freedom from the paralysis of sin, we find healing and joy. In what practical terms... What can you and I take home today from God's message to us? First of all, I'd like to propose that if you are burdened with guilt and shame, if there are things in the past that you've been hiding, and you desire peace of mind and a new start, Jesus has promised to cleanse you if you repent and confess it all. And Jesus longs to give you that freedom that forgiveness experiences. Oh, it may not take away the consequences of sin, but Jesus promises to put away your sin, and that's awfully good news. But maybe you've confessed your sins, but you really have a hard time believing that Jesus has forgiven you. You know that accuser of the brethren? Satan is really good at messing with our minds and bringing up the past over and over again. Go to Jesus and thank him that he has done as he's promised. He's cleansed you from all unrighteousness. Claim it. Say it. Believe it. There's another thing, too. And although we don't have time to go over every aspect of it, I believe there's another thing that we need to learn today. It's difficult. But since Jesus willingly forgave us and covers our sins... Shouldn't we be gracious and loving Christians and forgive others too? You know, so many of us hold on to grudges, resentments, pain, hurt, anger. We cut off people in our lives. We distance ourselves. We can be civil if we have to, but we won't forgive and we won't forget. I believe that God wants us to forgive freely as he's forgiven us. What if we practice forgiveness in our own families like Jesus forgave us? What if we practice forgiveness in our church like Jesus did on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, going back to my original story, I needed grace. I needed grace. I invited people over for lunch and then failed to be there, and I hurt them deeply. I was so sorry, 
I needed grace so badly. They were angry. They were bitter. They were hostile. It wasn't until months later when they discovered I had hyperthyroidism that they forgave me because then they could give me an excuse. But friends, God doesn't look for excuses in our lives to forgive us. He forgives us because we are so needy and in such desperate situations, and he loves us so much that when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And he doesn't give us what he deserved. Jesus took that on the cross for us. He took our guilt. He took our punishment. He took our sins so that we could have the life that he gave for us so that we wouldn't have to die the second death. It's the good news of the gospel. It's the the joy that God sets us free. Sing, shout, rejoice in the joy of God's forgiveness.